Hello everybody, this is our next presentation of the Ghost of Winter 2024 series. Today we have Terra Cross doing an introduction to Giant Geyser. Um, if you have any questions during the chat, feel free, or during the presentation, feel free to drop that into the chat. Uh, we will be holding a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And with that, we will go to Terra. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me in this presentation. My topic is introduction to Giant Geyser. I'm very excited to be part of this flagship GOSA presentation series. And let's get started. First of all, I want to point out that this is the second of the series and there are more to follow coming up. This is the calendar for those uh, presentations. The next one is on March 5th, presented by Dimitri Stumbos, talking about when to walk away. Just a quick introduction about me. My family started visiting Yellowstone in the 1980s. I've considered myself to be a geyser gazer since 1988. I worked at the Yellowstone Research Library for a few years. That was a very formative experience for me, learning about Yellowstone and the geysers. Then I moved on to be the editor of the GOSA Transactions. And I have also been a thermal volunteer at various times, including the last few years. Giant is one of my favorite geysers, so of course I wanted to talk about it today. Uh, I want to thank some people here. The GOSA presentation series, I want to thank the GOSA board and especially Will Bokel for getting this started and Art Hausler over at the GOSA website for facilitating everything. I want to thank Pat Snyder, Scott Hanley, M.A. Bellingham, and David Schwartz for the photos and figures that I was using in this presentation. And finally, and probably most importantly, Giant's historical background. I did not do the original research for this. I owe some individuals for that. First of all, George Marler. He was a Ranger naturalist in Yellowstone starting in 1937. He was there for several decades. He moved on to become the park geologist. He wrote many, many things about the geysers, including his inventory of the features on the, along the Firehole River. That was an important source for me here. He was also obsessed with giant geyser and came up with a lot of the original thinking about giant and the original terminology. Secondly, Lee Whittlesey, his wonderland nomenclature, the history of the geographic names in Yellowstone was a very important resource for the early history of giant. Mike Keller, also obsessed with giant, a geyser gazer for many decades now, wrote a very important article, the 20th century history of giant geyser. And finally, T. Scott Bryan, our author of the geysers of Yellowstone, also has been keeping a running list of giants eruptions since 1955. And I am indebted to him for that. This presentation, is an introduction to Giant. So the things that I will be talking about today will be a historical overview and discussion of how their Giant has built up to the recent active phases. I will talk about Giant's most important underground connections, and I will be talking about possible indicators of changes in the Giant system that might indicate shifts or more or less activity in giant. What I won't be discussing today is 
a catalog of every feature with a known connection to Giant. That is more than 30 features. So for that, I will point you to the Geysers of Yellowstone, as I just mentioned, by T. Scott Bryan. It is in its fifth edition right now, but I hear that a new sixth edition will be coming out very soon. And then also, I know many of you are keenly interested in learning more about giant hot periods, but I feel that that is a considerable topic all by itself. So today I will cover very basic information and if giant does indeed show more signs of life, you can look for another GOSA presentation focusing on giant hot periods. Giant Basics. It is located just under a mile from Old Faithful in the Upper Geyser Basin. It is Yellowstone's third largest geyser after Steamboat and Excelsior, and that also makes it one of the world's largest geysers. Eruptions put out a massive volume of water and reach heights of anywhere from 140 feet to 270 feet with a typical range of about 160 feet to 220 feet. It has always been erratic and it may fall dormant for years at a time. And in fact, it's had just one eruption in the last five years. So actually, why am I talking about giant? Cue the video, Will. One moment here, everybody. I just realized the audio isn't going through, so let me fix that here one second. Okay. There we go. Let's get that restarted. Sorry about that. It might erupt. It might erupt. It has only gone twice this year. It's looking very, very good. There goes the sign! Yes! Yes! It now commenced in earnest, and we witnessed one of the grandest displays of waterworks ever beheld by mortal eyes. The fountains of the great deep seem to have literally been turned loose again upon our sinful world. At first, it appeared to labor in raising the immense volume, which seemed loath to start, on its heavenly tour. But it was with perfect ease that the stupendous column was held in its place, the water breaking into jets and returning in glittering showers to the basin. The wavering to and fro of such a gigantic fountain, when the column is at its highest and glistening in the bright sunlight, which adorns it with the glowing colors of many a gorgeous rainbow, affords a spectacle so wonderful and grandly magnificent, so overwhelming to the mind, that the ablest attempt at description gives the reader who has never witnessed such a display but a feeble idea of its glory. Our entire party was perfectly wild with enthusiasm. We could not suppress emotion, but shouted and cheered until we were out of breath. And some fired guns and revolvers in the air. So great was their excitement in the midst of such a display. <laughs> 
One second. The uh, I need to get back to Terra here. It, it this is it's throwing this off. Terra, are you there? Why did sixty feet and it roars like thunder? Bijou may enter a steam phase, which is one of the loudest you will hear in Yellowstone. It's very impressive. You will get that whether you have Mastiff and Catfish or not. And then I'm throwing in a picture of Turtle here because uh, it is not so spectacular, but it is a fun little add-on. It's even rarer than all of the other geysers on the platform. And finally, to round out our tour of the geysers around Giant, we have the platform vents. These photographs label the platform vents. I want to point out that a GOSA special edition of the Geyser Geyser Sput came out in 2018 that was a guide to Giant hot periods. That is now available on the GOSA website. It includes these and a lot more information about giant hot periods, but I'm going to give a basic rundown right now. First of all, I want to talk about what a giant hot period is because there are varying definitions. George Marler was the one who named them giant hot periods. And he says this in his inventory. It was not recognized until May of 1951 that during an eruptive cycle, giant has frequently recurring periods when both the temperature and the water suddenly rise in its crater. At the time of this change, several small vents on the platform in front of the broken section of the cone erupt to heights varying between inches and about eight feet. Marked changes also occur in the larger units on the platform. I designated the time of this change as a hot period. It is only at the time of one of these hot periods that giant erupts. These hot periods give me an impression as if a giant sponge at depth were suddenly being squeezed. And I love that image because it evokes the idea that there's water oozing out of the platform of giant. So we can generally say that the term hot period refers to the cycles of heating that occur in the giant system. And actually, when Marler was a, the geologist of Yellowstone, he was sometimes out there with a thermometer testing the change of the temperature in both Mastiff and Giant, and he determined that that temperature would increase by one to three degrees, and both Giant and Mastiff would rise together. As Mastiff begins to rise, with water becoming visible from the boardwalk, it will typically shut off Bijou, not always, but usually Bijou will shut off and it will be quiet for the duration of mastiffs being up. Water begins to flow out of the small vents in front of Giant's Cone, the most important of which is feather, and it is also the tallest vent. If mastiff fills and the vents have water or overflow, but feather does not start, this event is referred to as a bathtub because that's exactly what Mastiff looks like, a bathtub. 
In our standard practice, though, the start of feather sing signals the start of a hot period. And if feather erupts, then you have a full giant hot period. And the giant hot period duration is the duration of feather. Other vents may join in. The sequence will vary some. Mastiff may overflow and surge. And the right hand, va hand vent of catfish may splash. I think that was the previous slide, so I'm just going to go back there. That is the sort of splashing that you will see from catfish during a hot period. And it's the vent, it's easy to remember, it's the vent that's closest to the hot period action that splashes during the hot period. Mastiff may overflow and surge. These surges could be just a bit of a boil. They could be more of a doming surge like you see in this photo, or it could even be almost jetting surges about as tall as giant's cone, which by the way, is about 10 feet tall. So that gives you an idea if you're trying to estimate how tall things are on the platform. Generally speaking, the more discharge and the longer the duration, the better. This photo shows feather to the right of giant's cone, and then you have a nice surge in giant in the center. And then over on the right, there is cave vent, which is active during strong hot periods. My apologies. Mastiff surging may build from the doming surges to an eruption five to eight minutes after the start of the hot period. With very rare exceptions, when mastiff erupts, giant will follow. But if mastiff does not erupt and rather drops, usually feather will stop. If feather stays on though, the water level may rise in giant with surges that can build to an eruption. And that's what you saw in the video. However, most hot periods will end and water levels will drop without a giant eruption. So giant always starts during a giant hot period, but most hot periods end with no giant. Moving on to the history of giant, I'm going to actually start before anyone documented its existence and talk about the geologic setting and this cone. The central upper geyser basin where Giant is located is a neutral chloride thermal area with many large geysers and notable large cones, which have been deposited in areas that were filled with glacial sediments that came from local rhyolites. And as you sit and wait for Giant, you're looking across the way at a ridgeline that has the Mallard Lake flow. So that's where some of that rhyolite comes from. All of these cones are believed to post date the most recent deglaciation in the Yellowstone area between 15 and 14,000 years ago. One of the great mysteries to ponder while you wait for giant is how this weird broken cone came to be. Some have hypothesized that it was blown apart by an eruption of more than ordinary force. But as we watch the crack on upper mortars cone gradually open up, a slower decomposition helped along by freeze thaw cycles and dormant periods becomes a lot easier to imagine. All it would take would be one original crack. Giant sides have been smooth since the first photographs were taken in 1871, meaning that the souvenir takers that hacked the beaded exteriors off of geysers like Beehive and Grotto were not responsible for its appearance today. It seems unlikely that any sort of human caused explanation for the deterioration of the cone would make any sense. So another factor to consider in this extreme broken state of giant's cone is new research suggesting that Old Faithful, 
experienced a decades-long dormancy during a severe drought from about 1230 to 1285 CE. It is not unreasonable to guess the giant was also dormant during that time. And this could help explain how extreme weathering could have contributed to the erosion of giant's cone. Now we move into recorded history. 1870, it was documented by the very first exploratory party into the Yellowstone region. They named it along with seven other geysers, including Old Faithful. They thought it was that important and they were also so impressed by its size that the name giant seemed obvious to them. Early records from the first decades of the park come from explorers and visitors, geologists working for the US Geological Survey, soldiers working for the army, and the army was in charge of keeping Yellowstone, so to speak, before the formation of the National Park Service in 1916, and also tour guides. And of course, tour guides were keenly interested in what giant was up to to try to get their groups to see it however the tour guide printed tour guides that come out often say that giant erupted about every 8 to 14 days or maybe every 7 to 13 days or something in that range and we have some records from soldier logs and things like that that indicate that yes some of the intervals were like that but it also seems like maybe they wanted to encourage people that they would have a chance to see giant because longer intervals also occurred during those years. And we don't really have a complete picture, um, but we do know that giant was quite active in the early decades of Yellowstone history. Mike Keller's historical research, he believes that there were no long dormant periods before the 1940s of giant. And in fact, there were some very good years in the 1880s. Perhaps it was going even every other day during that time, which would equal the best it's ever done that's been better documented. The leanest years for documentation are the 1910s and 1920s. And it seems that many records from that time were lost and perhaps people were not as interested in geysers. A few of the first ranger naturalists in Yellowstone working for the National Park Service started to write about giant in the 20s. And then in 1937, George Marler began his decades long tenure in Yellowstone and contributed much to the knowledge and documentation of giant. We move on to the 1940s and 50s, when several changes seem to have occurred. First, a pronounced seasonal pattern favoring the months of August, September, October, and November began to emerge during the 1940s. Also, a change in the 1940s was the first documented full years of dormancy in 1947 and 1948. But then activity resumed in September of 1949 and began to build to an active phase in 1950. And it turns out that this active phase that would run from 1950 through 1955 would be the best that we have on record. There were 465 total eruptions of giant recording during that period. Most intervals were two to five days but actually the shortest interval, and this is the shortest interval on record, is only 28 hours, if you can believe that. Um, it was so frequent at that time that my family, my dad and his parents and his older sister, when they visited Yellowstone in 1953, they got to see part of a giant eruption. And this photo is taken by my aunt in night, July of 1953. So that's a fun bit of family history for us. And then 
we get to, sorry, once again on the slides, we get to the sad part of the giant story, which is a very long period of inactivity that began in 1955. Of course, the 1959 Hebgen Lake earthquake occurred during the beginning of that dormant period, and it's hard to say how much that may have contributed to it. But at any rate, there was a period of 30 years when giant erupted only five times, and the longest interval during that period was 15 years. So we can certainly hope that we don't get a repeat of that. And geyser gazers in the 1980s became very familiar with this list of eruptions since 1955, which started to grow. You had the four eruptions, 1963, 1978, 1982, and 1984, and then 1986, 1987, three in 1988, another in 1989, four in 1990, two in 1991, and then one each in 1992, 1993, and 1994, and two in 1995. And that indicates a ramp up of activity. People were very excited, of course, because for the first time, in a very long time, Giant was having hot periods. And so the potential for Giant to erupt was there, even if the intervals were long. One thing I'll note about that, if you look at the eruption list in Geyser Times, I'm sorry, I don't have it here, but if you look at the eruption list in geyser times, occasionally there would be a short interval of like seven or eight or nine days, a follow-up eruption after the previous, uh, after the very first giant eruption after, after a period of months, there would be a follow-up because there would be hot periods after those, that eruption. Now, there were many others that had hot periods after but did not have a follow-up eruption, but it is something that is known with giant and it actually happened again in, 2010, that there was a pair of eruptions. It could even be as many as three weeks apart for those pairs. Now we move on to moving into the first active phase since the 1950s. This shows giants intervals in 1996 and 1997. And the first thing I'll point out is that these dates along the bottom show that it indeed was picking up steam there in the late season, those months that it favors August through November. And then there's several longer intervals, it kind of wobbles in and out, and then it begins to stabilize. This active period in 1997, we had a slowdown in April and May and June, and that's to be expected from the seasonal pattern. But the best times during that period, it was erupting every three to five days. And that would be in the fall of 97 in particular and into 98. However, starting in the spring, early spring, I would say March 23rd, actually, it began to slow down. And so the active phase tailed off in early 1998 and by the, those lower months of May, June, and July, uh, giant had fallen dormant. During the period between that active phase and the next one, which started in 2005, it was kind of an interesting intermediate period because giant was still erupting. A lot of intervals were several months long, but there were also clusters of intervals that were much shorter and even as short as five days. The longest break during that time was from April of 
2002 until July of 2003. And then actually in the whole year of 2003, there were only two eruptions. In 2005, there was also a break from December of 2004 until August of 2005. That long interval was interesting because we saw some strong hot periods and yet giant didn't seem to want to erupt. And part of that may have been because turtle geyser was pretty active during hot periods. And that photo that I showed you of turtle was actually from a hot period in 2005. But we move on to the ramp up to the next active phase of giant, which was from 2005 to 2008. And my extreme apologies for not being able to wrangle this figure any better than I did into Google Slides, but these this is the ramp up to in 2005 and 2006 to that active phase. And you can see it's a little bit similar to the other one. You have this wobbly pattern going and then it begins to stabilize and it's happening in the late season again. And then of course that active phase stabilized to intervals of usually about four to eight days, sometimes a little bit longer, I think as long as 14 during the best times of that active phase. And then it tailed off much like the what happened in 1998. The intervals began to get longer, the hot periods began to get more spaced out, they eventually weakened, and Giant fell dormant again, and it only had a few eruptions after that before it went very dormant between 2010 and 2015. So there was a very long break of more than five years. And finally, our last active phase, which this graph again could not quite get it to work into Google Slides, but this shows 2017 and 2018 where you have these longer intervals wobbling down and then stabilizing as the active phase progresses. There's something that's different about this active phase though. First of all, intervals never got really short and regular like they had in the other two. It kind of looked like it was going to do that in September of 2018. And then something was a little different about this sequence because the intervals were still pretty erratic and then it just stopped in March and it did not have that tail off, it just quit. And going from there until this November 23, 2023 eruption, that's four years and nine months was that interval. Now I want to talk about some of the connected features. This map shows the extremities of the underground connections at Giant. I actually didn't label Giant on this photo, which is kind of funny, but you can see it there with the T boardwalk going down to it, kind of right of center. And then the other features all have shown some connection to Giant historically. Marathon Pool, Grotto, Splendid, Oblong, Solstice, and the Purple Pools. So these distances I find interesting. Oblong is 470 feet south of Giant. Across the river from Oblong is Solstice Geyser. It is 420 feet from Giant. North Pur Purple Pool is to the east and it is 285 feet from Giant. And then the most incredible one, Marathon Pool, 810 feet from Giant, showing that connection all that distance, all the way down to Oblong. Pretty incredible. And then Grotto Geyser, of course, to the Northwest. It is the closest connection. It is the biggest other geyser relationship with Giant. We have the Gip which is in between Grotto and Giant. And that's interesting. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. And then Splendid. There's been documentation that Splendid is connected to Giant and that is all the way out 10, 1,025 feet 
to the west. So about Grotto and Giant, this is what Marler had to say. There would seem to be little question that the Grotto group has been the principal cause of Giant's record of cyclic behavior. This being true, Giant's earlier eruptive cycles must have been attended with a de decrease in the function of the Grotto group. So Grotto is extremely important, but there was no documentation before Marler of the relationship other than one comment by one of the USGS scientists, Walter Weed. So we just don't know a whole lot about that, but we have learned quite a bit since then. Grotto's cycle usually centers around an average of about six hours with a normal range of four to eight hours for its eruptions. And that's, it's just usually erupting most of the time without a considerable deviation from this. These uh, regular short mode eruptions last one to three hours. Every one to three days though, or longer or shorter, depending on the activity, Grotto has a long mode eruption referred to as a marathon. These can be very important to Giant because what it happens is a long eruption of Grotto will cause a long pause of activity of Grotto and that allows heat and water to flow into Giant instead. So it is after a Grotto marathon that you will be looking for the best opportunities for Giant. And in fact, it seems possible that that's what happened this last November. Grotto was seen erupting on the webcam all day the previous day. And then the next day, Giant erupted and Grotto was not seen the next day on November 23rd. So the GIP, I said I would talk about that. It is an in-between feature. It's kind of interesting. I wouldn't go so far as to call it a fulcrum or go that far, but it is this hole in the ground between Giant and Grotto that can give you some idea of which direction the water is flowing and how much water and heat is in the system in general. So it will tend to have higher water levels near the start of Grotto near the end of Grotto and sometimes five to seven hours into a marathon. And that start and end of Grotto is also a really good time to look for giant hot periods. 2018 is a great example. There were a lot of strong giant hot periods near the end of Grotto, a normal Grotto, this being the kind that lasts one to three hours and not a marathon. And there is a picture of the GIP full. Normally the water level will be down. So you have to kind of peer into it and hope that the lighting and the sun angle is good enough to see it. But it will come up and it will be this high with a giant hot period. So it's that far away from Mastiff and yet it shows a very direct connection to it. So about other connections in the giant group. This is what I am hoping is gonna be most helpful about this presentation because we're in a period right now where it's not in an active phase. We're kind of guessing as to when the next eruption might happen and we're looking around for signs. So I'm gonna start with the easy connections. These are the reactive connections they're not signs of an impending eruption, but rather there are signs that these features are related to giant after an eruption. Grotto may experience a significant delay of its next eruption after giant erupts. And that delay, when I say significant, that's going to be some hours that it's quiet when it wouldn't normally have been. It's also pretty common for Grotto to go into marathon after an eruption of Giant, but that is not always the case. Uh, Grotto Fountain, which is the photo here, 
if there has been a marathon following giant, the next grotto fountain and grotto start may be extra strong. So if that is that happens, it's well worth getting down there to see the grotto start. Grotto fountain will be taller. It will last longer. It will sometimes be steam driven. Usually the grotto start is also very strong as well. It is common for oblong to have a shorter interval after giant, or if oblong hasn't been very frequent, it may follow giant with an eruption, the first eruption in many days or maybe even many weeks. The purple pools will typically see a drop in their water level after giant erupts and a marathon pool may show its reaction to giant by overflowing after an eruption that was seen in 2007. Now we move on to the more interesting and thought provoking connections. We have a saying in uh, amongst the gazers, which is that weird is good. Uh, but I will add a huge caveat here. These are historical examples that I'm giving. They are not meant to be any sort of concrete prediction for giant. This group is in a constant state of change and something that was good before may turn out not to be so in a new active phase. So with that huge caveat, I will say, we're looking for things that have changed in the group. So at Grotto, that might mean a disruption to the typical cycle, such as an extra short eruption or a significant delay from an expected start time. With that delay, there may be a long series of eruptions by South Grotto Fountain. We saw this wall giant was active in 2006 and 2007 several times. That will typically happen when giant is not uh, associated with a when the giant eruption is not associated with a marathon. Now oblong, it may have shorter intervals before giant instead of after giant, or as seen in the spring of 1998, oblong erupted first and then giant would follow within 24 hours. Now that connection has never lasted for more than a few eruptions of giant, but it's notable to point out. You're also going to be looking for a disruption to the patterns that you typically see. So the example that I'm going to give here is rocket. So you have something in the pattern that either fails to happen or happens out of sequence. An example of that with rocket would be in 2006 and 2007, sometimes it would start before grotto. And usually that was a good sign that giant was going to erupt soon. And then in 2018, an even more fascinating example was that we'd have a series of normal length grottos that would end with rocket. So you'd have grotto, rocket, and then grotto would quit and there would be a period of quiet. Grotto would erupt again and rocket would shut it off again. And then there would be an eruption of grotto when rocket didn't erupt. And that's when you want to run over to the giant platform and see if there's going to be a hot period. We got some eruptions of giant from that in 2018. Looking at the GIP, the water levels may be higher than the current norm or high at unexpected times. One example of that from 2018 was building up to when I was expecting a a hot period at Giant because it had been some hours since the last strong one. And every time Bijou paused, I would go over and look into the GIP and it would be high, much higher than I was expecting to see for many more minutes than I was expecting it to be up. And Giant erupted that night. And then in the Giant group itself, higher water levels. This is important to think about for this phase because it might just be that water was seen in a few hot period vents and that's all. It didn't actually have a whole hot period, but water levels were high enough 
that there was water in some of the vents close to Giant's Cone. So an example of that happened in August 2008. Uh, rust and slit vents, which are right up against Giant's Cone, had water in them. They're just a little bit of discharge, not that much the day before Giant erupted. So it wasn't a hot period, but obviously a cycle had occurred where water and heat rose up in the Giant platform, and that was enough to kick off Giant the next day though no hot periods had occurred prior to that. And finally, I wanna talk about connections indicating shifts in giant's pattern. So this might be a shift from more erratic to more frequent or vice versa, or a shift of the type of activity that is seen. So maybe there will be more activity from Mastiff geyser during a certain phase or less. Uh, so these indications of shifts, uh, it's useful to watch for in the system and especially when giant is really erratic, these may be important. Uh, examples of that would be grotto suddenly having way more or way fewer marathons, an increase in energy in a grotto giant system, which more grotto fountains, bigger, more energetic spa, stronger bijou, higher gip, something like this happened in April of 2006. Uh, with bijou, you could see shifts in behavior, such as more or less steam, shorter or longer pauses, differences of timing with Mastiff. With Mastiff, it may start depth charging and the depth charging, I didn't explain that, but you'll understand what it, I mean when you see it, it bursts from a low water level and splashes water up onto the platform. If that gets stronger or that gets weaker, things might be changing in the group. At oblong, sudden changes in interval, uh, shorter or more regular or vice versa might indicate a shift. And then some examples from the purple pools, they may experience changes in overflow. For example, in April 2006, when Giant was very energized, South Purple Pool dropped below overflow, which is its normal state. And then it resumed again when Giant's intervals lengthened in May. And then after the final eruption of that active phase in April 2008, South Purple stopped overflowing and instead East and North Purple Pool overflowed for a while. And that's the most recent time that has happened. And finally, I know I'm running long here. Thank you for your patience with me. Uh, some tips for catching giant. Should we be so lucky as to see increased activity? The FRS radios are enormously helpful for tracking giant. It means that it, with several people involved, nobody has to be there all the time to see what's happening. If you don't have an FRS radio yet, I highly recommend checking out Art Hausler's GOSA presentation, talking all about two-way radio technology in Yellowstone. He has recommendations for FRS and GMRS radios and other useful information. If you can, check in on Giant and Grotto on a regular basis, especially if Grotto has had more or longer marathons. If you're not in Yellowstone, make a point to follow along on Geyser Times and make notes to yourself as you go along. That will be very helpful. It's much, much harder to dig back through and try to find that information. It's easier to connect it while it's happening. Trust your own judgments. I can't emphasize this one enough. Try not to rely or put pressure on experts for predictions. Those predictions are always guesses. They're not, it's not like predicting a geyser like Grand or Old Faithful. Those are not guesses. Those are solid um, data pointing to uh, interval range. With Giant, we're always guessing and there is no amount of experience where you can't be surprised by Giant. But if you make it a priority to check Giant regularly, you may be rewarded with a surprise of the pleasant variety. And finally, stay tuned. If we start to see more activity 
There may be another GOSA presentation going into much greater detail about giant hot periods and what to look for there. In the meantime, we will be putting some resources in the education section of the GOSA webpage. I mentioned already there's a guide to giant hot periods. And very soon after this presentation, I will add notes and a bibliography so that you have some suggested reading. I highly recommend doing that reading ahead of time. There's a lot of great information in the GOSA transactions in the pages of the SPUT. Uh, and of course, if you're interested in a more deep dive, I recommend the Marler Inventory and the Whittlesey Wonderland Nomenclature Names History, and that will give you some useful background. And with that, I think I am ready for the Q&A, and I guess Will is going to relay those questions to me. Do you think we have one here um, that was a little bit further back? Is uh, you mentioned the water output? Um, have any estimates been made on how much water giant dumps out during eruption? Which one moment here? Uh, do you want me to go back to those? Okay. Okay. And Tara here is actually going to first go back to the couple slides that uh, we missed after the video because of the audio issue. She's going to cover those here. So right I now. understand that the first slides after the video uh, were cut off. I'm sorry about that. But here they are. Um, this is an eruption in 2007 that I saw and was able to get some pretty nice photos of, just kind of underscoring the spectacular nature of the giant start and the fact that. It hasn't changed hardly at all since that description by Edwin Stanley in 1873. And I know there is a figure out there that a million gallons come out of giant in an eruption. That figure was estimated by George Marler. He does mention it in his inventory. He said he and a park engineer used chips to estimate the volume but nobody has attempted it since then. And it's kind of hard to ever really strictly measure the discharge from a geyser because of course you have multiple runoff channels. You'll notice in this picture on the right, there's water falling onto people and onto the platform. It just goes everywhere. And now we go on to this, which is uh, Mastiff. Mastiff will erupt with giant sometimes, as I said, not always, but it is pretty spectacular scene when it does. It will go 30, 40, even 60 feet. And that will be for several minutes before giant. And then sometimes it will continue on after giant has started, like this photo on the right, which is in 2007. There were some eruptions during that active phase when Mastiff would continue for several minutes after giant, and it was an overwhelming sensory experience. 
I'm being told to keep going here. So uh, we move on to catfish and turtle. Um, the eruption on the right is turtle, and that was actually during a hot period, but it can also go during giant. It's not as common as catfish or mastiff, but it can erupt to a few feet during giant. And then you have catfish, which is actually quite spectacular, uh, 20, 30, maybe 40 or more feet. And it sounds like thunder when it's in steam phase. All right, I've received some good questions. Ah, I'm being told to go on. These platform vents, which is good. We can look at these platform vents while I talk about how long a typical hot period will last. Uh, so the longest hot periods are 15, 16 minutes, but most of them will be way shorter than that. Uh, so when you say typical, it's kind of hard but on average, maybe three to eight minutes. So a short one would be one to three minutes, perhaps. We might uh, only see feather or only feather in southwest vents or only feather and rust, a little bit of overflow from mastiff during those weak hot periods. And then a medium hot period would last three, four, five, six minutes and have a bit more discharge, some boiling from mastiff. And then your stronger hot periods will be eight, nine, 10 minutes, maybe longer than that. Uh, have a lot of surging, a lot of discharge. Most of the vents will be active, including cave, which I'll advance to this photo, which shows the location of cave in relation to giant's cone and feather. And then on the left of feather in this photo, it's feather satellite. That's also an indication of a medium sized hot period, at least when you see feather satellite. Then another question, when giant ac exited active periods, we have good data for was the decrease in activity indicated by declining hot period strength frequency or both? Very good question. Yes, that is the case. That's what we have data for though. So 1998 and 2008, we have data indicating that the hot periods would become farther spaced out and weaker, just gradual decline, decline of giant's intervals as well. And at some point, giant has one final eruption and the hot periods that follow that eruption just don't ever build back to the full strength. Uh, we don't have information from 2019, however. The last eruption was, I believe, March 10th of 2019. And that's a really difficult time for observations because the park was either closed or about to close. So there was not uh, anyone to visit Giant and take a look and see what happened. And that's interesting too, because it just stopped right in its tracks. It didn't tail off with a few longer intervals and gradually weakening, weakening hot periods, at least that we know of. It just had a like six day interval and then stopped. So that was a bit surprising to me. And I guess I'll also add here that it means that this last active phase was a bit different. Uh, we did see less of a, a distance between the last eruption of that active phase and the most recent eruption than we did between the in the gap between 2010 and 2015. But things uh, may have been changing. And again, that just illustrates how the whole system is constantly evolving the relationships, the heat flow going from grotto to giant and all these other features that's going to change gradually over time. Next question. Oh, this one is fun. Have do you have a favorite eruption you've seen of giant? I apologize to everybody who was not there, but I am going to back up and say that this eruption here, September 1st, 2018, 
was a doozy. We had mass diff that we were not expecting because it hadn't been erupting that year. We hadn't seen very many grotto marathons. So we had mass diff beforehand, and then we got giant in these beautiful, beautiful conditions. That's my favorite. There are a bunch of others that would be 1A for sure. My first, I went out of my mind. It was incredible to be there uh, with only a few people there in late October of 2001 when I got to see my first. And of course, by then I had missed some eruptions, uh, quite a few actually. Um, so the effort that I put in, and again, this goes back to my comment that um, if you make it a priority to go check on Giant before you do other things, you're thinking about, for me, I love Fountain. I'd love to drive to Fountain. But several times I thought, you know, I don't want to drive to Fountain until I have checked on Giant first. And I walked down and Giant erupted that day. And a fourth question, do you think that a stronger eruption of oblong could mean anything at Giant? I don't know. Um, I would like to see stronger eruptions at Oblong in general. That to me would mean more strength and energy there. Uh, its relationship with Giant has been kind of wobbly. You know, we, we've seen it erupt after Giant or have a short interval or erupt after Giant as a reaction, but we've also seen it act as a precursor to Giant. And then of course in 2006, the whole group seemed to be energized. So this idea that uh, Giant was, this idea that Giant has necessarily uh, means that all the, that Grotto becomes weaker, not necessarily the case. We saw bigger Grotto fountains. We saw bigger oblongs. I remember the overflow from oblong reaching all the way and kind of lapping up towards the boardwalk during 2006. And I would love to see that come back. And I think that is it for the questions. So I wanna thank everyone for tuning in. Very excited uh, to have a giant eruption in last November. And I definitely hope we will see more. It could be a year, it could be two years. The sooner the better, as far as I am concerned. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, thank you very much, Tara. And if you have any other further questions, feel free to reach out to us uh, on our contact form on the website or to the presenter themselves if you know them, and we can get more questions answered. Other than that, uh, we do have Dimitri Stumbos' presentation next week on When to Walk Away, which will be all about kind of the statistics and data of when, when a guy's maybe not as uh, likely to go. So 